I'm absolutely delighted to be here today with Michael Sartor Sartori. Is that the yep. correct pronunciation? Um, Mike, I believe is we can call you Mike. Um, sure. Mike has a YouTube channel that focuses, if I'm correct, on um, looking at working in the trades as an honorable profession. <clears throat> And that's very interesting to me. So when I saw your YouTube channel, I thought, I want to talk to him and find out all about him. So I wonder if you could tell us, Mike, about your background and your upbringing, and then what led you to start that channel? Sure. So um, I grew up in a Christian home. Both of my, both of my parents were um, new believers, like in the, in the 70s, kind of around when there was a lot of... Uh, charismatic things happening and some of the Jesus movement and not as much of that particularly, but, um, uh, but they, but, but the, that was the time in which they both came to, to know Christ. And, um, so from my, you know, from my very earliest age, we were always involved, uh, in church. Um, eventually my dad actually became a pastor. Um, it was kind of, uh, and and uh, unofficial, he, he he took an interim role just to fill in, and he ended up staying in that position for about twenty five years. So, oh so um, but but you know it was a good experience. It uh, it was a very small church, so I, I got a little bit of the 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 experience of being a pastor's kid, but it wasn't um, <laughs> as traumatic or detrimental as it, as it sometimes is for others. So so. Um, but uh you know they were always um just encouraging us to um learn uh you know looking back i see it was a very a very fruitful and productive um environment and um uh you know there were there was always um a lot of just curiosity about things and and it was you know i guess maybe because they didn't come from a particular tradition or anything like that um you know kind of you know you would say we were basically in, in an evangelical kind of a church environment but um there there was um just a lot of um you know if you didn't know the answer to something it's well let's find a book let's find the answers we'll uh you know we'll kind of figure figure that stuff out so i, I got exposed to a lot of uh different aspects of um the faith as well as um, like art, my mom was very interested in that, and she okay. studied that in college. Um, my dad was a teacher; that was his full time job. So um, he was, you know, he was always taking us to uh, all these um, nature preserves and things like that. So um, I really just I when when somebody asked me like, "What's my like special thing?" I, I kind of figured it out to like I like learning new things, and learning new things somewhat quickly is uh, and and teaching myself is kind of like my my best skill so um and and eventually how I got into the um the trades is a, a lot of that I learned because um my dad would uh do a lot of handyman work during the summer because he was a school teacher so during the summer months he would uh work on people's houses and things and um as a bivocational pastor he was always fixing things around the church or in people's houses and things like that so um i learned a lot of the um got my start just learning stuff from him um uh, when i went to college and all that i had planned to um go into the ministry eventually so i went to bible college kind of uh worked for a church for several years um it was a busy church um i actually got a lot of opportunities to do some of that kind of stuff while i was there um because they were always um you know put like these big stage productions on or, or you know around like christmas and easter and that so designing and building like big backdrops and other creative things i got a lot of chances to um learn and hone my skills more in that and um eventually uh i kind of got turned off from the idea of working working for a church I, I still very much wanted to be involved in church but i thought you know i'm just going to get a job 
we moved to uh, Texas where we live now and I got a job doing carpentry uh, full time. And um, I, I kind of came to the realization that like, even if, even if I was being paid to preach or anything like that, like I would still need to be doing something with with my hands, you know, making things or, or working on projects and things like that, because it really helps me to focus and meditate and learn and, and think about all the ways that God's working. And um, so my my kind of goal with starting a channel around that um, was really just to encourage people to maybe skip some of the the uh floundering that i i i did in where you know where i was trying to pick a career and, and all that stuff and and i think that you know maybe um encouraging students to learn um a trade with their hands even if it's just like for a year or something it gives you such um a foundation in learning how to work hard learning how you can push yourself and i think that it prepares you even if you were to go on to college and all those things um it's just it's just become such a skill that's so so lacking overall in our society um and you know that's to our to our own detriment i think and so um but beyond that there i think is great spiritual value in learning how to connect our our hands and our bodies to the physical world. And, you know, because it's, it's God's creation. That's what we're playing with. And, you know, it's very, very much um, connected to like what you do as an artist. I don't, I don't, I, um, there's actually a, a little book by Hans Ruck, Ruckmacher. And he, 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 uh, it's called Art Needs No Justification. And he, he talked about how, you know, prior to like what we call the renaissance or whatever there really wasn't any distinction between an, an artist and just a craftsman in, in general mm -hmm. so the same person that would build your house or build your furniture would be the ones painting the murals and and making the carvings and all these things and um what we kind of separated those things and, and we, you know we said like w w some of those are very high elevated forms and the other ones are lowly and, and unimportant and um, I think that's really uh, a loss that, that we, we view it that way. And he, and he goes on in the book to explain all the different reasons why. But um, so, you know, I think for, for people who are maybe artistically inclined, um, I didn't, I didn't, I chose not to do that in college because I knew it wasn't going to make a living. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think there are there are things that use a similar skill set and can kind of fulfill that creative um, impulse, but it's a little bit more um, financially rewarding for the average person. And it's just it's useful. It's useful stuff to know. So that was a, that was a lot. But so what kind of carpentry do you do? <laughs> so um, I work on uh, kitchen cabinets. Um, Usually I do all the warranty stuff and uh, I've um, gotten to a place now where um, I'm doing a little bit of the, a little bit more of the administrative stuff, which I'm not crazy about, but um, it's, it's good to learn. And uh, I'm usually the guy that's in charge of training new people that when they come on and things like that. So that, that's something that I do enjoy sharing those skills and helping other people to learn. So. But yeah, so kitchens, you know, all the uh, all the new homes being built around here. Yeah, that's a big thing in Texas, right? Yeah. So many people moving into Texas. All the people leaving California are going to Texas. <clears throat> yep. Yep. So is that behind you? Is that kitchen cabinets or what? What is? So this is just you're... um this I just I took apart a bunch of cabinet doors and things and this is just a closet here um. And I just oh, covered okay. it with, I just dressed it up with paneling to uh -huh. give a little bit better video background for video. So yeah, no, it yeah. looks good. Looks Thank good. You. So you know, you were you were saying that that um, art used to be seamless with the objects that we use every day. 
Mm -hmm. But it, like even during the Renaissance era, the artists were also the ones that were tasked with designing armaments and designing um, the walls to protect the city from the invaders. And, and so they were also architects and mm -hmm. um, Michelangelo is the one who figured out how to build the dome at, at St. Peter's. And so um, art used to be seamless with a lot of things. Yeah. And it, and it almost seems as though by dividing it, they haven't said, oh, art is something higher and things are something lower. It's more like they they lowered things by making them ugly. <laughs> and so, so the only hope we have of retaining any beauty is, is with art and architecture, but even that has gone in such a ugly direction. So um, do you find when you're doing kitchen cabinets that, that you enjoy building a certain kind better than another kind because of the, the, uh, contamination with beauty so to speak um well i mean i would say you know like i i do like a little bit more of the classic looking you know the more furniture style looks rather than the sleek modern and to i mean to me it's uh, i think it's better in the long run the the cabinets that are made out of actual wood rather than man-made materials they tend to wear a little better you know they don't look as like the 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 the, the man all the man-made materials look great when they're brand new and painted but they don't age well so um you know so i do think that there's there's something to that but i'm not i i don't know i try to i try to see the the positives in in all these things you know it, it, you it, you know there is something um we, because you know we have a lot of these conversations about the loss of beauty and all these things and i understand it i can i can appreciate it but you know it was creative pursuits by a lot of engineers and a lot of designers and things to make some of these other products that while maybe they've sacrificed some aspect of aesthetic beauty the fact that you know many many more people can afford their own homes and things like that i think that that's a, a different type of beauty in a way you know so um so i i try not to be i try not to be snob, snobby about it um yeah well one of the things that troubles me is how <clears throat> disposable everything has become yeah so um so we when we moved into this house we had kitchen cabinets that were uh, made of this they're called laminated mm. I'm sure you're familiar with that it's some kind of hardboard or something and then they laminate over it with some sort of plastic finish so they looked like wooden cabinets but they had this laminated thing on them <clears throat> and while they lasted it was terrific because you can scrub them down with a you know a scrubber and keep them clean and uh, everything is just beautiful and seamless but then over time, that lamination starts peeling off. And then what are you going to do? You can't paint it because you've got all this stuff peeling up. And uh, what we ultimately decided to do is rather than replacing, rather than throwing out the boxes and everything, we just replaced the doors and had, the, had everything refaced. Because I just can't stand the idea of filling landfills with all this perfectly good material. Yeah. I was watching a video earlier today of um, the beautiful train station in, I believe it was Philadelphia, this absolutely architectural marvel. And when you were inside it, it was all archways and light streaming in through the windows and everything. And some modernist came along in the 20th century and said, oh, that's old fashioned. And they tore the whole thing down. Can you imagine how much concrete and because it was it was bigger than the Parthenon. <laughs> mm -hmm. And to tear all that out and throw it into landfill and put up some square monstrosity. Even if the square monstrosity is new materials that have been designed by engineers, it's kind of heartbreaking. Yeah, but yeah I understand what you're saying about efficiency. I mean, my husband is in high tech and certainly there is a benefit to 
building in layers of efficiency so that more people can afford things. Well, I mean, yeah, like, well, as an example, all the stuff behind me, this was all trash that, you know, I got from work for free and there was nothing wrong with it or, you know, it needed some repurposing in, in different ways, but you know, the, the, uh, the wood was still good. And um, I think that's, you know, I think that the problem, the big problem is just with the consumerist way that things are, we just don't have any connection to things because even like if you, if somebody put, buys cheap furniture from Ikea, at least when you buy this stuff from Ikea, you have to put it together yourself and you get like a little bit of a, if it's your first time you're, you do have that sense of like, Hey, I didn't know I could put a bookshelf together and I guess I can't. And, and that's, you know, that's a small thing, but at least like that connection to the item, um, is is better than you know calling just calling a company and having them deliver everything and put it where it goes and you know um i think uh and so i think the basic kind of skills that people used to have it used to just be so ubiquitous and you know I, I think obviously like my grandparents generation you know they went through the depression and they had such a mentality of saving anything that might be of use or might be of value and you would never you wouldn't throw stuff away until it was completely used up you know you would fix it or refinish it or do whatever you could to keep things going and um that um what really what really i think is val valuable about that experience is you know it's 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 driven by necessity because of the poverty and the what was available but the the most important impact is what it had on the people like going through the experience of, of having to really think about these things and i think that's that's the biggest thing that we kind of miss out on is um just which is even why like when i say you know as i say like yes i don't like the manufactured cabinets with the plastic coating on them i think they're kind of tacky but you know i i look at it and i realize like this was a passion project for someone and I mean, a lot of the stuff, it's like, it, it's sawdust. That was literally just trash at one point, you know? And they said, hey, we can do something with this. And somebody came up with some kind of solution. Now, when you're when you're grinding full trees down just to make sawdust, that's kind of a problem. But when it's, you know, when it's reusing a, a byproduct, then that's kind of, that's a pretty cool thing. So, um, and, you know, I think that, that's something, you know, we can just do on a, on a smaller scale individually, you know, um, you know, I, I like, uh, part of my old job was at, um, uh, my old church, they had a couple thrift stores and they would get all sorts of stuff. And sometimes we just repaint it or whatever, or sometimes I'd take stuff apart and completely and make new things out of it and all that kind of repurposing and stuff. I think that is, um, I think there is a kind of a spiritual aspect to that in, in that, uh, you know, God comes to fix, comes and fix, fixes the things that are broken. Sometimes it does require more deconstruction and more demolition. And sometimes there's not as much that can be redeemed as, as uh, in other circumstances. But, um, but I think that the, um, this is just my kind of pet peeve, but when I see, because a lot of the the things, you know, where people lament the lack of beauty and, and looking at these times uh, when we had these classical aesthetics, tear, you know, just they almost have an impulse of like, well, you're just going to tear down all the modern stuff to rebuild the old stuff or whatever. And I mean, well, that's, you know, needlessly destructive if if those if those buildings are functional or or whatever. So kind of um figuring some sort of a both a both and between those things you know because i think at some point in the future we'll look back on a lot of the um the modernist architecture and things like that and you know maybe we don't need to keep all the buildings but we should keep a few of them around so that we can appreciate them for what they did and you know talk about what what we can do better in the future so I, I like that approach, especially 
<clears throat> when you were talking about the note I made was mindfulness, but I, what you were basically saying is we need to have a connection to the things that are part of our lives. I mean, when, when I was first married back in the day, probably about the same time that your parents were becoming Christians, we didn't have any money because we had pitiful paying jobs and, and, uh, but we liked going around to Roman sales and <clears throat> picking up mm -hmm. things and repurposing them. And back in that day, you could go to an antique shop and you could get some things for cheap, you know, but that they were very interesting. And you, then you could have all things that nobody else had anything like that. And you could go to auctions and have the auctioneer kick the thing and say, it's old, but it's sturdy. <laughs> you know. And you could bring that thing home and refinish it and turn it into something for your home. And so your home was, well, you were encompassed with things in your home that you had a hand in, that you had a hand in choosing, that you had a hand in working on. And uh, and it, it used to make me very sad when I had a friend who'd get married and, and she and her husband had a lot of money and they would just go to the furniture store and just have the furniture store send a designer and they just fill their house with this stuff. And it's beautiful. Looks like a model home, but but it happens all at once. And so there's no memories built into it. There's no history built into it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I read somewhere, somewhere recently about how all the like HGTV kind of, um, uh, the aesthetic has become the main aesthetic, at least for home, home decorating is basically always to keep in mind, like the resale value of your house. So everything's gray and neutral and not, you know that that quirky eclectic thing when you when you go you know i remember like when i went into my grandmother's house and there was you know i guess it was like a lot of the items were from whatever time they finally were able to afford nice furniture back in the 60s or something but you know but then mixed in was all these older heirlooms and all this the stuff and, and it was just kind of a um a you know a, a mishmash of different stuff but you know everything had memories and and everything did have a an association and a story tied to it um and I, you know i think that that that's um a valuable a valuable uh experience that yeah we, we do miss out on so have you found with your with your youtube channel that you're or or even before you started your channel that you're meeting more young men that are starting to see the trades as being a, a valuable path forward. Uh, yes, I, a few. I, I, I've not been as able to do as much of the kind of networking side of things. It's at this point. So, um, so I, I kind of I titled my project Tectonic School, and. Um, Right now, I'm doing a lot, I'm doing more writing just because it's easier than I can do it in little chunks rather than the video stuff. But kind of my goal is to um, create a curriculum to kind of incorporate the spiritual elements, learning things from the Bible through the experience. Um, my my goal is. Um, and, and what I want to do is I want to make this like an, an open source project. So I want to make resources available so that anybody can do this. So my goal, I, I, and I think best it would work if it's um, done through businesses. So whether it's uh, somebody who has a construction company of some sort, or just, you know, if they work as an individual to give them resources where they could take somebody on as an, as an apprentice and while they teach them, the trade skills kind of have a, a little devotional um, package of materials that they can go through and connect the spiritual importance and the meaning of what, what they're doing. Um, so, and so my goal is hopefully within the next, my goal is, so I just, I just turned 39 on Saturday. So my goal is next year, by the time I'm 40, I, to be able to, leave the company that I'm working for, go on my own so that I can hopefully get one or two guys to come work with me and teach them personally. So I want, I want to model this thing personally, but I don't want to just create my own little empire. I want it to be, mm -hmm. I want it to be spread, you know? So, so I think, uh, it, and, and it's really connecting 
small companies, uh, people that are working in the trades with young men, older men with younger men, and really connecting it to a local church in a, in a local place and kind of reintegrating all that, all the aspects of um, our work life and our faith and family life and all those things. Cause you know, that's, we've just become so separated and atomized in all these different areas of our life. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I want to, I want to, you know, because personally I have found that this is a, a career path that allows for a lot more, um, integration in my own, in my own life. And so that's, you know, part of why I, I think it's a good, it's probably a good solution for a lot of, uh, young men. So. Okay. So in what way does it provide more integration? <clears throat> um, well, Well, because well, for one thing that it's using, you're actually using your body, you know, like, um, you know, cause right now most people, if they are working at a computer somewhere, they're working eight hours and then they, your body hasn't done anything. They're still tired, but then they have to force themselves to go to the gym. Whereas I'm burning a lot of calories as I go out throughout the day. Um, some, some days more than others, but you know, you, there's a physical aspect to it. Um, there's also depending on like, I tend to work on, uh, I work on my, on my own, but it, in our job, like or in, in our, uh, little office here every morning, we have a little meeting and we'll just talk about how the, the previous day's jobs went and we'll share, you know, tips and insights with each other about how things went and how things could have gone better. And, um, you know, so there's a, there's a community aspect of it, sharing wisdom. A lot of times, depend, you know, you're you're working with other people much, much more consistently, depending on the the kind of work. Um, you know, so that's, um, you know, and and that kind of problem solving with other people is, um, like to me, that's like I I was I've never been, you know, maybe this is part of just my personality, but I've never been great at just socializing like at a party or something, but I easily make friendships when I'm working with other people or if I'm involved in a project with other people. And I think, I think that there's a lot of people that, you know, that's the case. Um, so it, it helps to build good relationships. And then, um, you know, the other thing I like about it is that when you do have a lot of time to work on your own, um, because it's not necessarily all, strenuous mentally um you know i'm i'm getting to listen to audiobooks and things on youtube for um a big portion of the day and you know it that that can be kind of part of a, a guided um curriculum you know because you think about like even uh how we have this great loss of uh people studying the humanities and great literature I can listen to eight hours a day of audiobooks. So if I want to focus on great literature, it's going to be faster for me to digest a lot of that stuff than many people who are sitting in college classes. So, um, so those are those are some some of the, the some of the ways. And then you know when you're done with work at the at the end of the day, I don't I don't. There's a lot of stuff I don't have to worry about. I don't have to worry about, you know uh intellectual stimulation i don't have to worry about exercise too much um i can just go home and enjoy time with my family so that's that's why i think it's a, a more more integrated kind of lifestyle well so speaking of family you you have been away from your youtube channel for a while because <laughs> yeah so our, our um our third daughter was born on uh march 30th uh and um so yeah, so it's, it's it's been a little bit of an adjustment, uh, changing from t uh, two kids to three, and um, and and beyond that too, my wife and I also recently took over the youth ministry at our church. So oh wow, so, so you yeah. got a whole bunch more children. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So fortunately, they can all take care of their uh, bathroom bathroom problems by themselves, so. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, but no, it's good. And, and, and that's, and that's been helping me too, because, you know, as I'm, uh, 
working through teaching them the Bible and stuff, it's helping me to kind of um, assess a lot more like where people are at. Like if they're not, um, cause some, some of the, some of these kids are coming in and they have no background or information in the Bible or anything like that. And being able to break it down to a, a level where they can understand and, 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 um, and start to get at it is, um, really helpful. So, um, so it, in, in a way it, it might, my, some of, some of what I've been doing is, is almost like, um, the way, uh, Jordan Peterson took a psychological approach to the Bible. I, I'm been looking at a lot of the passages about these building projects and kind of taking a construction approach to it because you know you learn if if, if things aren't straight and plumb and square like it's not going to work or you know if, if the wall is not stable if the foundation's not good it's not going to stand and so those are those are truths that are externally understandable and then it gives you a, a, a better entrance to starting to understand some of the deeper things in the text, I guess you could say. So, well, yeah, I mean, there would be so there's just miles and miles of layers of things that you could do with that. Yeah. 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 I mean, even, even thinking about the whole thing about not using dressed stones for some things, but then using dressed stones for other things and, 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 constructing a building out of stone but without using any mortar and what's required there in terms of fittedness for everything and how all of that lines up with reality right you you have to face reality if you're going to construct something yeah that's, that's really good yeah i like that yeah and and my and my other thing was like you know i i guess i kind of came on that because you know i realized one day like as i'm working on these things like I understand like, okay, like at my job, the things have to make sense. They have to fit together. They have to be right and correct. And therefore, when I'm listening to like the, the, the Bible and it's talking about the construction of the tabernacle and, you know, the, the men that God chose to teach the others and all these things, you know, I'm realizing like, oh, this, this is, it's immediately graspable to me because I'm used to working with my hands and, 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 and doing this stuff. But, and, you know, sometimes you even get this when you look at the commentators, you can tell like they don't, there's a lot of practical things that they maybe don't, don't know about. And I, I mean, I think, I think the ultimate is like my goal someday is to have enough land to, to, to uh, raise some sheep because there's so much uh, in the Bible about sheep and shepherding. And I feel like, um, you know, the, that was that was even the training that God gave Moses and David. Go be a shepherd for some amount of years, and then you'll be ready to come and and lead these people. And so, um, that's that practical knowledge was it was the it was it was everywhere before you know the industrial revolution or whatever. So so that's kind of what we've lost is you know now we have to translate the information we have to learn about shepherding or building things from a book and then try to understand what the bible's saying whereas if you have that firsthand experience it's probably going to make a, a whole lot more sense right away so it kind of removes a, a step in the process yeah i mean it, it it almost means like you could have a whole shelf of bible commentaries <laughs> yeah the construction approach to bible commentary the shepherd's approach to bible commentary the artist's approach to bible commentary i mean yeah i mean because i mean, I mean because the bible is reality it's truth mm -hmm. and so it filters into or it should filter into every aspect of life that's that's really good i i was reading an article this morning about going back to this issue of young men in the trades um there is a shortage of linemen, which is particularly a problem because they're dry, they're trying to drive more and more and more uh, energy into the electric electrical sector. And the grid, of course, is in such terrible condition. But in order to keep the grid operating, you need lots and lots and lots of linemen. Hmm. But um, apparently it's gotten so bad that the investor owned utilities are poaching linemen from the co-op utilities 
because they can pay them more. So they're giving them like a 15% um, raise plus a sign-on bonus and all kinds of things to get linemen to move over from the co-ops. But it seems like what we really need is to just uh, get more men interested in being a lineman. I mean, there there is a trade that is essential for almost everything that happens in in this country, at least, because everything runs on electricity. And so if the linemen aren't taking care of things, where would we all be? And they're really heroes in a sense because they're climbing up those poles in all sorts of weather. And so there probably are a lot fewer young men who are willing to go out and risk their lives for something like that. But I mean, it's a very uh, necessary and um, heroic career. So yeah. I don't know if you know any linemen, you might want to be one on your show. Yeah, you know, I do. I, uh, but yeah, I do know one from uh, back where I grew up. I, yeah, we'll probably talk to him about that because he was always and he was always going out of state when there was like a you know weather hurricanes and things like that because of all the down power lines and stuff. So, I mean, yeah, it was definitely it is definitely a, a an adventurous job in in many aspects. I do think that that's kind of one of the um, you know I'd say like that that's kind of um, another thing I've noticed, like there's, there's, there's just, there's a big problem with like masculinity. And um, I don't know if you've had a chance to read it yet, but Nancy Piercy, and you know, she's been on your show. Um, and she came out with this book called the talk, the, the toxic war on masculinity. Um, and it's really great. Cause she's just kind of highlighting how, um, she she goes a lot of through the history and a lot of this really is from um the time of the industrial revolution and men are really connected to their work and they kind of have to go where the work is and but you know as things have gotten so much more focused on college and and kind of the managerial class jobs a lot of times women are better at those jobs or, or at least they take to it more easily. And so um, there is kind of this big crisis of that. And I think that, um, you know, one, one way that people have been trying to um, attract like masculine interest in, in things is through like martial arts and things like that, which I think, you know, there's, there's some good to it, but um I think that like the skills in building things or, or, or in they're constructive. So it's there rather than being destructive, it, it, it can use, you know, because you can struggle and exert all of your strength against physical objects, struggling to, you know, move stones into place or, or, you know, with down power lines or any of these things, you know, and it, it really, I think, um, it feeds a lot of the same desires and, and um, uh, impulses or whatever that, that come through, you know, uh, through battle or through warfare or things like that, but it's for a more lasting, lasting good. Cause you know, we can't hopefully, you know, I think say that there's a, there's a, you know, a psychological benefit to like men being in battle and banding together and the camaraderie and all that stuff. But it's not worth starting a war just to get that psychological benefit. But I think maybe like um, a, a good construction project is is a is a good substitute or even just, you know, the way like farmers used to had to like struggle against nature. I think we've we've conquered nature in so many ways that, well, the only people there are to fight or other people so you know that's kind of a well that's one of the things i remembered most strongly about what the years i lived in the midwest for many years and in my young adulthood i lived in iowa and north dakota and both of those places north dakota more so are very harsh environments mm. and you can't survive as a loner you have to have neighbors and uh, neighbors have to help each other and <clears throat> Even in Iowa, there were frequent uh, tornadoes that would come through or flooding that would 
wipe out a crop for one farmer, but maybe the other farmers were doing okay. And all the farmers would come together and go in and help him start again. Or, um, you know, if somebody's barn gets blown down, everybody would come in and help them build a barn. Well, that kind of thing is building community and building bodies at the same time, right? And yeah. And I think that the the loss, the growing loss of the family farm environment has really damaged that whole endeavor. Because yeah. these, these big corporate farms, I mean, they they don't care about community. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and, when I, and I'm trying to strike a balance with that stuff because th that's another aspect where it's so easy, it's so easy to say like, well, the problem is all this progress and we have to go back, but yeah. you can't, you can never go back. And the, yeah. pro the progress does benefit us, but that means that there's some more new thing that we need to find and, and struggle against. That's, that's the next thing is, you know, because if you're just always always looking back here um uh, it just it's just not it's not productive but 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 it's very important to learn from the the past but um um that yeah so that's kind of that's kind of a lot of what what I'm trying to figure out as I'm kind of developing these ideas and and um and writing about them and um and a lot of it too is uh you know, there, there, there is a lot, you know, like you're talking about how these bigger corporations are able to peel people off from the other ones. And then you get, you kind of get into this, the, the area of like policy and, and economics and all this stuff. And, and these are really um, factors that we don't always think about that have, you know, a, a huge impact on on that stuff so so eventually you know we need people to go into politics and and we need entrepreneurs and and people to run even big companies but hopefully with uh not just a profit motive but some or, or seeing that like money itself is not the highest um thing that you can earn but the real best product is quality people and that's that's what i think my whole my whole thing is is that um we've kind of given up on developing quality people for the sake of cheaper products and, and things like that so wow well i like your focus on balance and i'm not just mm -hmm. throwing out everything that that is uh, modern or efficient. Um, a few weeks ago, I ran across this YouTube channel where this guy has taken the the uh, data from the architectural digs in different ancient cities and found a way to use some of this um, these architectural apps that'll do 3D versions of what the building would have looked like. And he's done recreations of ancient Rome and ancient um, Athens and ancient Egyptian cities. And so you're watching this thing and you're walking through the streets of this ancient city on YouTube. It's really beautiful. And you're looking around at all the beauty and there's no cars and there's no pollution and um, the buildings are just massive and awe-inspiring and you're thinking wow you know what would it have been like to live here and then you have to think and there are the slave quarters out on the outskirts of town where everybody's probably starving to death and scrabbling for scraps so that a certain portion of people can live in this extreme beauty all the time but we don't have that extreme beauty and we do have cars in the way and horns and and all of that but but everybody gets to be more or less enjoying a much better level of life, you know, actually even than the richest people did back then because they didn't have air conditioning and they didn't have refrigerators, even though they had these beautiful buildings, they didn't have a lot of the things that make our lives so much easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it, it, that's kind of like what leads to some of what the meaning crisis or whatever is that, when it, when people had all those struggles, 
the need was immediate and then when they found food or shelter or whatever you know they that was meaningful because that was what life was about you know it was surviving or whatever you know i, I think um i i think, I said somebody, you know, wherever that that um, term, I know Paul Vanderclay's talked about it or whatever, but like a, a luxury belief, and this is something where I see like mean the meaning crisis. I think is a little bit of a luxury belief because it's mostly of the people that have uh, achieved some level of success or or they've gotten all the things that society told them they need, good education, career, etc., but then find it's not meaningful. But, um, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, for those who aren't achieving those things, uh, it's kind of a similar problem. We're, we're only providing material solutions for them. Um, so I think um, we we need to this my, this is part of my my vision for this thought was like I'll, I'll take it from uh, the book. Nancy Piercy's book on masculinity because the statistics are like so crazy you know it's like um uh what 75 percent of all the deaths of despair are men suicides drug overdose it's uh 60 60 percent of or 60 percent of women graduating college which means 60 percent of men are not graduating from college um and but we don't have a huge influx of people going into these trades we have a trade shortage so we're getting like immigrants and stuff to do it and so what it leads young men to is um not productive be, not being productive members of society whether they're you know just online all the time or if they're involved in drugs or other things and um and what what I really think is that those people, it's not. I'm not just. I'm not even just thinking about this from like an altruistic standpoint of like I want to help those people. I actually think we really need those people. And one of the big motives for me is because I have three daughters, and I think if I had had sons, I would have just been happy to focus on my sons. But with three daughters, I'm more concerned about like who are the young men that are going to come and, and marry these girls someday and so that means i have to really think about young men in general and um i think that when i look at like our, our churches and stuff we need more people that are involved in trades so these young men if we can get them in the right path we can get them learning these skills it doesn't mean they have to be stuck in that life you know it can there's there's opportunities for advancement. There's uh, and and this is where I think, like we need uh, entrepreneurs that have a background in trade. We need policymakers that have a background understanding these trades, and we need these people in our churches too. Because um, I think because uh, church is the other one. It's sixty sixty percent of men don't attend church. It's very much more um, of a female space, and so we kind of we got to get this figured out a little bit and so i i see this as a, as a one possible way and um it, because it's because it's so much but really because career is so central to men i think and that's what um you know if you have a great career but you don't have that other stuff you have a meaning crisis but there's a lot of people who can't even figure out the career part and and that's um that's why that's why I'm I'm doing this because that that's kind of the the path that's worked for me, and I I think it would be helpful for a lot of other guys. Well, do do most um do most companies like <clears throat> let's say kitchen rebuilding companies or construction companies, of one kind or another, do they provide um uh, kind of um I just lost the word. It's like an internship. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. When, when, a, when a person wants to become a carpenter, oh, apprenticeships. Yeah. Do they provide apprenticeship type pathways for people to become, like if somebody wants to be a carpenter, 
but they don't have the skill already. You had the skill already because you worked with your dad, but yeah, what if somebody just it. has no skill and they think, but I think I'd really like to be a carpenter. Is there a pathway forward? There, for is, there is sometimes, you know, like uh, at our company, you know, it's just because at least in our, like, I work for a big company, but at least in our little office, you know, our bosses can take a chance on somebody if they feel like that's the case. And, you know, I've had some people where they didn't care for the work and they didn't stick around, but I have some other people that, did come in a couple couple people that came in uh one young guy and one old guy who was doing this kind of as a, a, a second career and no experience in this particular field previously and they're probably two of the best guys we have now so um i think that because there is such a need even there are, there is a lot of companies that are willing to take the chance on that um some places are more explicit in like hiring people to be apprentices, whereas others, it might be a little bit more of a, you just have to apply and, 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 you know, maybe if you do a good job on the interview, they'll take a chance on you. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm really specifically even thinking more along more uh, what, what I would like to see is more in the small companies, you know, because there's a lot of people that work, independently um and so many of the people now um and I, I don't know if you'd watched um it was a while back but when jordan jordan peterson talked with uh temple grandin did you watch yes, that one yes yeah yeah and she was talking about how you know she, we're seeing all of the servicemen in these different trades they're getting gray hairs and they're um you know because we had such this emphasis on college as like the ultimate thing and so many people came here maybe you know originally as, as immigrants started a business in a trade or you know something like that and and but they didn't they didn't take their own kids to you know enter into the family business they sent their kids off to college instead because that was what you were supposed to do and so you know now those people are getting ready to retire their businesses are going to shut down and their knowledge will vanish so i mean you know that was that's the other that other thing that i that i saw as a need and 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 especially especially for you know because if these are godly men that are christian men chances are they are not getting a lot of opportunities to go on stage at church or whatever or or, or teach but they've learned how to live a life faithfully to provide for families to be uh you know, hardworking and faithful in, in, in that respect, you know, um, approaching business from an, an honest um, perspective with integrity. And that's really important, valuable stuff that we need. So so that that was my other thing, seeing like there are, and I've gotten a chance to interview a few, um, a few of these older guys. And, um, you know, they, we need to get, collect their wisdom and, and pass it on to, to other people. So, so um, I think that, uh, that, that was my, my other kind of uh, hope for this. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not old, but I'm willing to pass on what I know when I can, but, but, but there's, you know, so many other people that have been doing this stuff for years and years. And if they just, you know, retire one day and then it's just, it's gone, you know, all their wisdom's gone. And, um, it, because it is a type of wisdom that's not necessarily written down in a book, um, but it's very valuable. So, you know, that's that's another uh, point of integration is that, and especially I think because there's so many fatherless young men. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I was, that's exactly what I was thinking about in in the church, in the churches that I've gone to, there are so many young men who are in single parent homes Mm -hmm. And once, you know, a couple times a year, maybe the church will have some sort of an event where, where extra guys can go along and <clears throat> act as surrogate father figures for the weekend so they can play volleyball or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But how great would it be if there could be some kind of a, a ministry or organization within the church of, of uh, skillful men who could give classes to these young men on, to learn things that would that they don't get an opportunity to learn because they don't have a dad at home teach yeah. them how to fix a car teach them how to build things um maybe take the young men on um 
opportunities to go to Habitat for Humanity and teach them how to do things while they're doing the, the volunteer work. Yeah. I mean, that could be a tremendous ministry because you probably also have older men who are skilled in a trade who are lonely mm -hmm. because they're widowed and they need an outlet for themselves. I mean, I just, I could see so many great things happening, but this kind of practical hands-on stuff just isn't happening in the church yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's really, that's like basically the whole thing in a nutshell. That's my, uh, that's my idea. I, I think the main problem is that we always kind of hope that these sort of like relationships will emerge organically, but they really don't, but it doesn't take a lot to, you know, say, Hey, uh, you know how to, be, you know, you know how to fix stuff. And, and, and it can also take care of like needs in the church. Cause it may be like, there's this um, elderly person, you know, they need some work done in their house. Could you take this kid with you, show them how it's done, and maybe the church pays for the materials or something like that, you know, or, and then and then take them out for lunch and talk about something, you know, like a little bit. But, you know, like um, and I think, you know, because I didn't realize that one day because I, I had been doing youth ministry for a long time and it was always like about having these fun events and you'd plan these game nights and things like that. And it was good. It was okay. You know, it was, but um, like, I remember one time there was a kid and, and uh, he just came with me while I was, I was working on some projects or I was building some things that we were going to use for the church. And, and he said like, that was the, like the most fun day I've ever had or whatever. And I was like, Oh, okay, well, that's cool. You know, like, like that's more, you know, like that's I, I think that yeah, people are really not seeing how much young men are craving that that kind of experience. And it's not it's not a, it's not a hard thing to provide, really. It's just to, you know, give them a little attention and show them some practical skills. And it's um, it's really, really goes a long way, you know, because even it, it's, it was interesting because we went, we went and visited our um, uh, our old church in new england uh last summer and you know i had a couple couple people come up and saying like i remember you uh really helped me out with this or that in high school and sometimes you think with kids it's like is, is this doing anything is it is, are they listening are they paying attention and it doesn't seem like it but sometimes it clicks and you know it's pretty cool to see how the you you do have a bigger impact than you sometimes realize later on so well, it seems like it would be something that would be eminently scalable. Uh, yeah. I just wish you the very best that you can get that up off the ground because uh, to me, that's just really exciting. I've been involved in the past with um, women's groups that have done things like that mm -hmm. because women are always planning and thinking about things like that because <clears throat> for whatever reason, women, well, I mean, women are just more social and they have more committee meetings and, <laughs> Yeah, my husband used to always joke around when the women have a, a retreat, they've got you know candelabras on the table with flowers and and uh, three tiers of cookies and and all of this kind of stuff, and they have chocolate on the pillows at night. And, and when men have a retreat, they have a box of donuts and a pizza. <laughs> That's it, you know. But but women have been thinking about these things about how to get the older women who have some wisdom to be working with the, with the younger girls. And, but absolutely we need those skills being passed down from generation to generation in the men. Yeah. 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 I, my, my, that's why I said like, it, it is very scalable. Like my, my, so the, like I said, my, my goal is to go on my own so that I can, at least so I can be like, I don't want to just, I don't want to just be writing articles and making videos and telling people what they should be doing. I want to be doing it myself because I think that that's, that's important. And, um, but, uh, you know, eventually if it, if it gets, becomes successful, you know, the the vision is like uh, Chad uh, called it, it was basically like working class libri. So like <laughs> have a big place, you know, where you can have, um, you know, all of the different workshops and things to really teach this stuff and have people stay there for a while and, you know, kind of do the community thing at a bigger scale, um, you know, so that, that would be like the dream someday, but, um, but whatever, you know, whatever, to, to whatever degree it, it, it uh, can happen. 
like right now I have I have youth students now, so I can force them to come and help me work on projects and <laughs> we'll get it started that way. But well, it sounds to me like you're talking about two. Maybe I'm confused, but to me, it sounds like you're talking about two different levels or two different organizations. Right. One would be <clears throat> this this thing that could be a a ministry within churches that could be in any kind of church. It wouldn't have to matter. I know what denomination the church is um, helping hands or something. You give it a name yeah. and you get it started in, in your local church. And then maybe it, it scales to a couple of other churches in your town. And then some other town hears about it. And then you have a annual convention of, and then other churches come and they all start to do it. And cause it doesn't require money. Mm -hmm. All it requires is a name and an idea and to get churches on fire about it, right? Yeah. Then you have this other idea, which is starting your own business with a business model that's um, establishing apprenticeships and training people in being quality people to be doing this work and to let it build into your life and your understanding of biblical truth and all of that. And that seems yeah. like two different things, or are they the same thing? Well, they're kind of the same. So I, the way I see it is local church has to be involved no matter what. So I would say like, if I was going to, you know, if I'm setting it up and my goal is set up, so like maybe I'm just providing resources for people to do this on their own, but like a requirement would be like, if you're going to work for this company or whatever, you also have to be going to church on Sundays, you know, like that's got to be part of it, whether you're going with your employer or or, you know, it could be also like um, churches that, that have families that could host pe students to live with them, or, you know, as they learn skills, um, things like that. But churches are also well equipped to start programs and things. So um, I think that having like, I, I think the ideal would be to have it run through businesses, because then people can actually start to earn real money and have you know, then you're getting like legitimate on the job uh, experience that you can, you know, take to a different employer or whatever, if you're searching for a job. So that would be, that would be the goal, um, I think, to really get people into actual careers. But if that's not necessarily possible, you could very much do um, a similar thing in, in church just through volunteers, just through people who have skills and are willing to share them. So that that's the scalability of it, is that on the one hand, it's just valuable to learn these skills and for older men to young mentor younger men, if they can do it to the degree where they can actually pay them something and, and help them get established in a real career. That's, that's the best, I think. But you know, whatever people are able to do. So that's, that's the way I'm kind of pitching it as a, as a scalable thing, because, you know, sometimes like, and, and like what I was saying, like, you know, it would be great to have like a place where you could have, you know, where you could host big classes, like a full blown trade school, that would be great to have, but I wouldn't want anybody to think you need that to keep them from doing something so it's better to it's better to start if you can just do saturday if it's one guy and one kid on a saturday afternoon that's great if it can scale to you know full time during the work week you know with somebody who does this professionally that's that's even better but it doesn't have to be that so that's that's how i kind of see the scaling the scaling thing go well, so have you ever heard of job core i think i've heard of that name before but well, back in the, must be the 70s and 80s, I guess, it was a federal program that was, um, it was kind of like a combination between Peace Corps and um, required military service or something like that. Um, but the idea was there are a lot of young people that were homeless for whatever reason never got a call never got a high school degree and um it was this federal program that would give them housing and training for two years but they had to agree when they came into the training that they would stay on campus and that they would never leave campus without permission because if they left without permission and were awol they would lose their place there and uh 
everybody had chores that they had to do in the morning to keep the place running. And so everybody's working together to keep the place running. You know, they have people clean the bathroom, clean the hallways, take care of your bedroom, just like in the military. But then they did um, like apprenticeship training. So they would teach some of them to be masons, do brickwork and stonework, and they would teach some of them to be carpenters. They would give them this training for two years. And at the end of two years, they would leave with a GED, um, the general equivalency diploma for high school and with some kind of a trade that they could go out and get a job. And then the government would give them $2,000 and the new outfit of clothes, almost like getting out of prison or something. Mm. Um, and when I first came back from Japan after my husband left me and I, I needed a job right away, the only one I could find was at this job corps that was trying a new program where they were going to try and give some of these kids one college level English class to give them an opportunity to see whether they might want to go on to college when they left this program. And so that was what I was doing was teaching this one college level English class. But I mean, it was pretty sad because a lot of these kids, even with their GED, they still couldn't write a sentence. So um, it was a bit of a struggle, but, but I thought the general idea of, of training people in a skill so that when they get out, they could go out and find some kind of a job was a really great idea. And if, if that could be scaled on a, a more personal level and not some kind of a government program thing, it would be very much like a uh, Libri for, for the trades. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, can you imagine how much fun it would be after you've had a day of working like that and then you get together in the evening and you're having dinner and you're talking about ideas and you're talking about how all the things that you learned that day would fit in with what you're learning in the Bible about building the tabernacle and building quality people. And I mean, that would be a very exciting thing to be involved in. Mm. Well, and that's the other thing too. I think like, it's not like Chad, Chad and I are not the only people that are on job sites and are listening to Jordan Peterson and mm -hmm. other, you know, more sophisticated things than people would maybe expect. Um, I've met some really smart guys, smarter than me in, in these, in the, these jobs on construction sites and stuff. And so um, I think, you know, the you know the, there's a, there's such a stigma of like you have to have a degree or you have to have come from this academic background for your opinion to matter or whatever and i think that i don't know i guess you say a lot of a lot of the very smart people that are working in these more real world applications listen to a lot of these smart people and kind of say they don't know what they're talking about because <laughs> it's all just pie in the sky and all that and so um but you know they just don't they just don't deal with it and what i what i see is like in our churches and stuff we need some more of these practical people for their ideas and 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 because they're problem solvers and they're they're um they're good at coming up with different solutions and they're good with thinking outside the box and and we just we need more of that you know because we just keep trying to do the same stuff over and over again and mm -hmm. you know we get the same results and um I think that, uh, you know, like there's definitely um, academia in, in general is kind of, I don't know if it's failing, but there's obviously there's a big problem with all the ideological shift of it. And then just the return on investment is not maybe as great as, as what it used to be. And, and so um, I see, I see that there's an opportunity for new kind of institutions and, and, and maybe not necessarily saying this program is, um, you know, is going to replace college or something. I mean, it could, if somebody's not, if somebody's not, doesn't want to go to college, they should, it's good for them to learn something, but, um, more, more so I see it as like, I don't think people that are just going the college route are going to start the new institutions that we really need um and i'm i'm very biased in my christian uh point of view from this thing but like you know i would like to see some you know because I, I was even thinking about like 
if you think about the rise of like uh the social media companies and all this stuff like people like mark zuckerberg and elon musk and these guys like imagine if we had some of those guys but who were christians and started something because like there was no they just made these new things that we use all the time now there was no law against starting these companies or anything like that like they create they they created a new thing that now we all see the value of it but you know we're all forced to kind of go along with their worldview presuppositions about these things their political slant um and you know just like just imagine if all these tech companies were started by people who wanted to make the algorithms suggest edifying things instead of salacious things or whatever you know like how how much better would the world be if if you just tweaked some of those algorithms a, a little bit or something like that so um so you know that but that's that's kind of my uh big a little of my my motivation behind this is just like get people out of their current way of thinking and and just take a risk and try something and and who knows what, what who knows what good stuff will come out of it but but i think it starts with like learning how to use tools. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a kind of the first step. Well, I, I've certainly learned so much from <clears throat> practical people in, in a lot of the conversations I've had on the channel here, because there are people like uh, Jeremy Firth, who works in machining and, <clears throat> and, uh, and Brad Bilski, who does um, machine design and things like that. And what they understand about measurement goes so far beyond what like a physicist can have all these ideas about how measurement works, but because they're not actually working on a machine that actually has to measure something, they don't understand that you can't be so precise. I mean, there's so many things that you learn when people are actually doing the hands-on kind of work that you can't learn just out of books or or just out of ideas. And um, I just think what you're doing is fantastic. Do you have a name for it yet? Yeah, so it's called Tectonic School. And it's actually, if you go tectonicschool.com. Tectonic, school .com, tectonic with like in tectonic plates or like tectonic? Yes. Like, yes, like tectonic plates. Okay. Because because Jesus was a tecton. And the, the term tectonic plates that that was it actually says like a a foundation laid in place by a a builder or whatever that's where it comes from so so the root the root of of tectonic plates comes from the same greek word where it where it describes jesus as a as a carpenter or a craftsman tecton okay but but so so it's t e c yes t o n i c not yes. t e c h no T E C T O N I C school okay. S C H O O L. Tectonic. Um, is that the name of your YouTube channel as well? Or yeah, it is. So but you can just go to tectonic tectonicschool.com. It goes okay. to my my uh substack where I'm I'm because I'm I've been writing more lately than doing videos, mm -hmm. but that also has links to the YouTube there. Okay. And yeah. And then, and I, and I have a personal YouTube that's actually bigger, but that's where I just put all sorts of crazy stuff on there. So uh -huh. <laughs> but well, if you name. want to send me the links to these things, I yeah. can put them in the, uh, in the description section. And this has been terrific, Michael. And I'm so excited about your three daughters. How, how old are they now? Five, three and one, no, the newborn. So, yeah. Wow. Well, you have a couple more years before the older ones can kind of take on some of the responsibility yeah. yeah they they help a little bit they can they can they can do some things so it's yeah. but at least now you know they they they'll they'll play together so it's uh we don't have to manage them so much when the ba baby's going crazy so it's good so we need some good mothers who are raising good men yeah so that your girls will have have a groom someday who who will be a good man quality people Thank you so much for the for your time, Michael. This has been Thank fantastic. You. And uh, I My really pleasure. look forward to learning more about what you're doing. Yes, thank you. We're very, very glad sad. to talk with you. Thank you. Well, you have a great day. You too. Okay, bye-bye.